so this is our opportunity to have an open discussion and the development of recommendations. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a clearly formulated recommendation. We can make observations, comments, question the presenters. This is your time to work toward those recommendations. Now that you're set up, think about this. You've had an opportunity to really focus on adult education and see the coordination of the two gen program. I'm sure that some of you took the opportunity to write some notes down, but haven't yet taken the opportunity to make a comment or ask a question, make an observation. So this is our opportunity to do so. So thinking about this, what's top of mind for you? What, what is it that you say, gosh, I really want the commission to hear this. I really need for us to explore this. I really think this is an opportunity for us to accelerate a program, create something new, get better results. What are some of the things top of mind for you all uh, to share with the commission or for the commission themselves? But I'm really struck at what a mind game this is in getting people a mindset. Um, adult learners, um, just you've got to, they've got to, they already feel like they're behind or they're, they can't do it. So it seems to me that um, part of this is a mind game. And then hearing also, the other kind of support, the wraparound services, the other support that's needed in order for this to be successful. So we think we're running a literacy program, but we're really learning running a program to help people feel better about themselves and actually have child support and other things. So I think um, I'm, in, I'm impressed that if we're going to be successful with this group, it's much more than just getting them books. It's right. first getting them to believe that they can do it, um, and then supporting them with all the other stuff that's necessary. So that's one of the things I'm taking away. The other thing is the importance of business. I, I heard that. That seems to be a theme that's gone through all of this, that our businesses and industries, particularly where people already work that may be uh, reading deficient, um, could step forward and perhaps fill in some of the motivation, help right. some of the motivation for doing this. And then I guess my fourth take home, third or fourth take home here is how did they get this way to begin with? And um, it seems to me that this is, a, this is a call for our public schools not to let people leave feeling that they are unable to read. Or how, how do we get people, why do we let people leave our public schools thinking they can't learn and they won't learn. And, and I, it causes me to think, I mean, I feel really sad that we are, we are educating students that leave thinking they don't have the ability to learn. And so, I don't know, I, I hope perhaps it calls us short in our public school system to, and I know they're doing everything they can, but um, it does make me wonder how do, how do, we, how do we have this generation of folks? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got to break the cycle somewhere. Yeah, and you bring up some important points. Let's go back to the first one. You were talking about this mind game piece. And that's, if I can use my own words, kind of that motivation to get involved and to have some self-esteem and some belief in yourself. Anybody want to speak to that? I know one of the examples was that those who graduate, those who are successful, are our biggest advocates. You know, as couched in the terms of if I can do it, you can do it also. Is there a program in particular or is there um, an approach in particular that is helping people or enabling people to go out and be advocates in their own community that you all know of? Thank you. There are programs, for example, that will invite graduates to come to talk to the students. Um, there are PSAs that bring in graduates. So there are efforts at that that we can look at, absolutely. We're doing that now, so the, the, the trial commercials that we did are very successful, and those are uh, people who, now they're actors that we hired, but they are people who, <laughs> oh, actually they gave away that secret, they are people who are in that same situation, and we have found that that makes a difference. Um, a lot of our programs, some of our program administrators here, use other students to teach other students. In the Accelerating Opportunity Program, we use those graduates to try and recruit more people to move into Accelerating Opportunity. Um, so that really, family and friends who are involved in it make a huge difference in terms of what we do. And that, those are some of the tactics that we've used and we're starting to use even more.
Um, so I, I do think we have a, a good bit of that going on. We, we finally realized that that kind of was a key to trying to make a difference, and so that's helping us with some of the programs. That model of student success that they're not seeing at home or seeing with those that are around them, they have to see it from somewhere or else. You know, our, our greatest population, regardless of, of race or whatever, is males. You know, if you get another guy to tell a guy it's okay to do it, right. and it's not a girl thing, just being real honest about it, uh, that makes a difference in terms of it. For uh, a lot of our uh, women with children who are involved in the program, mothers, their motivation is a little bit different. They're really trying to do something better for their children than was done for them. So the motivation factors you can use a lot of times with moms is different than the motivation factors that you use with some of the guys we have. There are just differences in people that you have to look at in terms of pride. Some of it is, um, you know, so, and some of the reasons some kids don't do well in school is because they're bullied or they're talked about if they do well and succeed when their friends don't. Well, they don't understand that that's a jealousy factor kicking in. Okay, right. they think they want to be a part of the team, part of the group, part of their peers, and so they're going to be right where their peers are instead of willing to get out of that model. And that's unfortunate, but my son's a teacher in the, in the school system, and he, he tells me he runs into it all the time. He has kids that are smart in his class, and he'll say to them, why are you not performing when I know you can do well? And they'll say, well, you know, we get teased from the other guys if we, you know, if we stick out. And so they back away. So he's forced to do some extra things to challenge them not to feel that that's a bad thing, but to try and raise the others up to the point where they see that's a good thing. And I think that's part of the issue with the school system. I want to talk to the, um, the school system issue just for a minute. Part of our problem with the new GED, because people kept saying they can't do it. And the first month that test came out, I'm going to be honest, we had five graduates and I freaked out statewide. <laughs> I said, this is really not a good thing. We got to fix this. But the more I investigated and looked into it, the issue was the mindset. They thought they couldn't do it. But my bigger issue was the teachers, because the teachers didn't think they could do it. So we had, we had the year of the teacher. So I said, OK, we got to turn the teachers' heads around, because they're just as stereotypical as a student. You know, I said, I don't think they're going to be able to make it. Once we got them, so we changed their learning techniques in terms of how they teach. Uh, we had to make them teach in a more holistic way, and the new test really teaches you to think. It is harder to teach somebody to think, to do word tests and so on. So we really had to back up for a year and teach teachers how to teach all over again in terms of teaching them how to think and to teach differently. Once we did that, the results started turning around. So it had less to do with the student in terms of the test itself and more to do with making sure that everybody in room the students and the teachers really felt the students could do it and the te change the teaching approach that we use. Once we did that, it made a difference. I think in the school system, that's also the thing, and I think some schools are trying to do this, that makes a difference. The mindset of the teachers and the teaching approaches that we use today aren't even the teaching approaches we used five years ago. They have to be different, but you're asking a whole system to turn around, that's a little tougher to do. I only got 1,100 teachers, so we can probably pull that off a little bit easier, but that really made a significant difference in approach. So if you can hold on to that for a second between you and Ms. Greenberg. So both of you had mentioned the fact that you, success breeds success. And you've had some success with these PSA programs and so on. Right. What, what's next for you or what, what recommendation would you make for the commission to consider to either accelerate this, enhance this, expand this, where you have people who have been successful going back to their communities right. and talking to people about their success and bringing more folks in? Yeah. PSAs that we did were a trial, and we used a little extra money we had to do it. So I can't fund that with, that's going to sound strange, I can't fund that with adult education dollars. I'm limited to funding teaching and teaching tools. Um, I can, based on the federal grant we have, put PSAs like that, like that out if I tie them to a class. Okay. And, uh, but I don't have the money to do that. So generally speaking, we use some of the profits from our GED programs to do that because there's a restriction in terms of what sure. we can do and what we can't do. So that further outreach, and I think uh, the, the young woman back here mentioned getting to them differently in terms of making sure they see themselves is an area that's difficult for us to touch because we've got to make sure we're using our dollars for testing and for teaching. 
So that help in outreach and awareness is really something that the commission can help us focus on. Uh, the fact that, our, that the business community would like to use those commercials in cafeterias and lunchrooms and, and have them up in doctor's offices and walls. Um, and we just, we managed to present it to our state board and there were some businessmen in the room who said, hey, can you give me a version that I can do this with? And we were able to do it um, and be successful with that. The partnership of business and education uh, where the business community can tell us what they need us to do to help their employees and help mm -hmm. them is, is, is critical and important and exciting as far as I'm concerned right. because bringing those communities together because our workforce is right there. Our student, a lot of cases, is right there. We don't necessarily have a good way to reach them because they're working. Right. Uh, I think if we can help people see if you sharpen this, as the as seven habits say, you sharpen the saw first. So if we can get them to understand really doing something for those students will make them more productive in their businesses, because uh, I come out of a corporate environment. So that's, that's the only right. way we can make that connection. Then the employees feel okay about doing that because they know they're supported and won't lose their jobs if they do. That's a great that, point. That makes Ms. sense. I just want to really emphasize it takes a lot of money and a concerted effort to maintain a really good PSA program. Um, as Beverly mentioned, the, the, and as I mentioned, the, the group that we're trying to target is really heterogeneous. So you need one set of PSAs in this community, one set of PSAs in that community. And then within the community, you need different PSAs. As Beverly mentioned, you know, the young white male is going to have a different need in terms of PSA versus the older, I don't know, Asian female who has three kids or something. You know, it's it just, it, 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 it and, and, and you need um, a certain kind of expertise to make very high quality PSAs, which is very expensive. So, so I think that you don't think you need a lot of money? Okay. Okay, well, that's good news. But, but we do need concerted effort, and right. she can't use her federal funding to, to, right. to, to keep that going on in, in all the ways that we need it to go on. Right. And it's more than PSAs. It's a real analysis of needs of communities. So you need to do a lot of work before, during, and after. Yeah. Somebody came to you and said, okay, you've done 43,000 students. We want you to take it to scale and do 250,000 students within the next two years. What, what would, how, how would you answer that? First of all, how would you get the 250,000 people? And secondly, logistically, can you handle that? And, and could you build the structure around doing that? So, so build and fill from the current scale to... Right, Okay. right. Well, after I got up off the floor, <laughs> which is the first thing I do, um, we, today we could not go to scale because we don't have enough locations to do it and enough teachers to do it. Um, we can increase the population we have. I, you know, I tell my programs at all the time, right? You can, yeah, uh, they know. Uh, we can, with the resources we have, get more students than we have. I honestly believe they're getting ready to shoot me. We could probably go back to 70,000, 80,000, I think in the programs. Um, the number of sites we have, I'm not sure we'd necessarily increase the sites as we would expand the hours that we teach and the number of people that we have teaching. Would you say we need more sites? I would say we do. Okay. And, so and I think they can answer these questions because these are, these are the three of the ladies from different parts of the state and we intentionally asked them to come so they can actually share in this discussion and, and give you their ideas. But can we do it? I personally think we can. I, th I think we can double it. I really do. But I think we can actually go beyond that. Reaching the students and getting them in the class has been tough. And we're starting to do that. How you do that, but we're going to need the business community to help us because a lot of them are working. I think that's part of it. But I'm going to pass, if that's okay, pass the mic to... Please. I'm Brenda Brown. I am program administrator at Central Georgia Technical College. And one of our challenges is... We're located on the technical college campuses, which are full to capacity. So we can expand in the community in other partner facilities, but not at the main campus, which is a challenge because we have all of the resources at the main campuses, the computers, uh, the accelerating opportunity program so that the students can enroll in the GED classes and the technical college at the same time. So we can expand some in the community, but not really where we need to on the college campus. And those are physical constraints, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. 
And so how would you expand into the community if you could? Well, one of the things that I'm doing in Macon is partnering with the elementary schools uh, to provide family literacy programs. And they, of course, have the facilities that they can allow us to use in the evenings or after school. Uh, we're setting up a program uh, under Title I with the uh, family uh, coordinators at the elementary schools. And we're going to provide the teacher, and they're going to provide the teacher for the children. And so we'll be located in their facility. So what are some of the other strategies for growth? If you, had, if you were asked to scale. I'm Susan Cross from Southeastern uh, Technical College. Uh, in Vade, but my office is on the Swainsboro campus. Emanuel County um, is a very large county, and as Brenda said, we're located on the main campus. And, you know, there are a number of little small community sites out in Emanuel that I could run some programs that people could get to rather than drive the 20, 25 miles into Swainsboro. Um, I have also partnered with Early Head Start. Um, we had a, a, an instructor there at the site. The, the parents were involved in the children's activities during the, um, some point during the morning, afternoon when they were there. I also was involved with Even Start for about eight years. We, we ran a really successful Even Start grant in Emanuel as well as Candler County. And I can tell you firsthand um, the empowering of a, of a parent to be able to, to inv be involved in their child's education, as well as the change in the demeanor, the attitude, uh, just the way the child carried themselves because their parent uh, was involved and was participating in their, their education. The uh, other thing we've looked at and we've tried to support is mobile classrooms. Because in some parts of South Georgia and North Georgia, the locations really are tough to get to. So we've, we've actually looked at a model. One of our workforce boards in Athens mm -hmm. has a mobile classroom that we have been able to use. It's just a, you know, it's a tricked out long bus, if you will. And we put classrooms in the computers in there where we could teach adult education and take the GED test and be able to circulate that around is, is another concept we think would work in terms of supporting uh, getting more classroom space and making that unit mobile. Um, the hard part is in communities where you really want people to get a GED, but there are no jobs. So they rightly ask, why would I want to take my time to do that? Because after I've got it, once you got me to the point where I'm really excited about working, I've got no place to work. So, you know, it's, it's in some locations, it really is a vicious cycle because there really isn't anything for them to do. So you can motivate them all you want to, and they get excited and they get an education, and then they're right back where they were because they have no place to use it unless they move. And they move, so the community's no better off than the community was before. So that's the other issue that we're dealing with in terms of, so it's imperative for us to work with the work community to make sure that we do something to improve the areas in Georgia where we want work to be, and then they don't want to go there because there's no workers. Right. So it takes a while to try and, and build that so we can get someplace with it. That's a hard part. This is a recommendation. I think it's worth um, spending some time and resources to say, how do we sit down with TCSG and collectively come up with a plan to say, what are the resources you need, the locations, the funding, the number of teachers, and that? Because to me, this sounds like a platform that's already there mm -hmm. that is doing what we're trying to do, but not doing it at scale. And, and then the other component would be beyond that is to say, and, and how do we do this in a private-public partnership? And then the other is to say, to take this two-gen concept and say, how do we integrate that into what we're doing here um, to come up with a, a plan that would allow us to take those two concepts both to scale with the support of the business community because you're talking about it's the chicken and the egg problem right having been on economic development board i can tell you businesses don't come because they're not a workforce That's the right. workforce doesn't want to be there because, because of the jobs aren't jobs. there yep. we've got to break that cycle good 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, speak to the question and, and then just to the recommendation about the platform and about um, business involvement in these initiatives. Um, I would say that the CLCP, which is the Certified Literate Community Program, is a really good um, avenue, a direct access to these providers. Um, a lot of our CLCPs will engage, will go out because, as you heard, we have a lot of part-time and limited full-time staff, so it's not like we can send teachers and administrators out to do this. The CLCP has that relationship with the Technical College and other providers to go out, engage business members. They are executive directors who regularly speak to community groups, businesses about how they can um, galvanize all the community resources around adult education. Um, we're only in about 89 of the counties in the state and we would love to make a big push to roll out um, throughout the whole state. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we're so excited to be participating in this because we really want to engage local chamber of commerce to um, you know, hear about what that means, like what it means to have a CLCP in your community. Um, we do things not just not just promoting, but also we'll we'll do fundraisers to support extra teacher salaries. So you know, as you heard, these program administrators talked about different needs when it comes to scaling up. Well, if your CLCP is there saying in your community, this community needs teacher salaries. Another CLCP may say this community needs more sites. And so that's what I think one of the powerful things about um, that kind of program. And Okay, I'm Sandy Baxter from um, right here in Milledgeville, Baldwin County, and I work with communities and schools and the CLCP, and I'm very, very proud and excited to announce that I am a recipient of a Literacy for All grant. So I wanted to explain, thank you, I was very, very excited. And what we're doing with that, um, Dr. Dorman is uh, a little bit humble, but um, he has built great relationships here. We have a wonderful relationship with our school system and with the Technical College System of Georgia and Georgia College. And to work on that, we're going to hire somebody to work actually with the parent resource um, person in the school system so that we can make sure that we are building relationships with parents. What um, I think the relationship with parents is a very important component of getting people to go back to school. I think taking away the stigma of not the accelerated um, opportunities, having that takes away the stigma of going in for a GED away from parents. They're actually going, they can say they're going for a certificate while they're getting, you know, other education. Um, and my question really was for Kristen is um, doing the 2Gen, uh, is there a good database out there and a good, um, a good model of outcomes? So um, one of the partners in 2Gen work nationally is Ascend at the Aspen Institute. And we've been really lucky that they've actually invested considerably in the Georgia leadership. And we actually have a team from TCSG, uh, GDEC, Department of Economic Development, and DECAL going to Aspen to learn from them in October. Um, they produced a tool called the 2Gen Outcomes Bank. And it provides those research validated outcomes for adults and for children and also provides what that assessment tool is or how you should collect the data. And what's awesome about it is you can literally drill into whatever it is you're doing. If you're doing a health program, if you're doing an education, an early learning, uh, parent engagement, whatever you're trying to do, you just literally like click on the topic area and then they drill down and they show you the range of outcomes that would be appropriate to use and then what are those research validated tools that you could use to collect them. So they've done all the work for you. It's fantastic. <laughs> Ms. Berner, thank you very much. Ms. Stovall. My recommendation would be to explore um, ways that TCSG um, adult education can offer classes inside of our school house build, our school buildings. So almost where you they still be functioning like they're normally functioning, but then I actually having TCSG offering those um, adult education classes with those students who are potentially um, going to be dropping out of school. So when you looked at, I think the percentage of 16 to 18 was about 17 percent according to the slide. Um, I think that, but I, from my experience, when my daughter was in in ninth grade. Most of the times when those students did not pass um, those basic core classes, especially in the course tests, more than likely they end up dropping out. So if there's a way to be able to collaborate together, 
by identifying um, those who potentially can drop out and having the school within the school specifically for those students, um, then I think that that will also help. And then it also will be able to help with the move on with ready or the accelerating program um, that could also kind of help them to stay guided with saying, okay, if you're able to finish this part, then this is available for you as well. Um, really, I'm, I think I'm going to say the same thing that Representative Stovall just said in different words. <laughs> but um, I did look up the data and the state data collections for the K-12 system last, year, last three years were between 20 and 21,000 official dropouts from 9 through 12. So Beverly is making a little bit of headway. A lot of headway, actually. Uh, and I know that what I'm fixing to suggest, the technical college system is already trying to do in a number of ways, but I think a recommendation from this commission could help support that and, and forward that along. The closer the partnership between the technical college system and the high schools in the K-12 system, the the closer the technical college system can come to capturing those dropouts, as soon as they drop out and not when they're 27, this accelerated opportunity piece sounds like a great idea for those students who leave high school who are disenchanted with what their experience has been in the regular traditional kind of model or who've not been successful or who are leaving for some other reason that's really unrelated to their experience at school. But this accelerated opportunity piece where they can really see a clear path to being employed while they continue their education I think would be critical and anything that we can do in terms of a recommendation to help support building that out and making that more possible uh, and more um, well received throughout the state would be a wise recommendation for us. Right. My comment is actually back to the PSAs and just from experience PSAs is too tight of a term that I think some may be confusing. PSAs are mandatory, they have to run them, but you're not going to get always the best spots. You're competing with elections, you're competing with all sorts of things. And what we've done as far as the CLCP in Columbus in that area is I've actually had money funding to recruit students to do public awareness campaigns where we would purchase airtime pay $200 to get the spots produced by the cable company and purchase, and they matched everything. They have given us in phenomenal prices per spot. They at minimum double everything we buy and we get responses. We're able to say, okay, we want volunteers, so this is the type of programs we want. We're looking for the more educated people in this age group. We're looking for students, okay? So we're looking for this age group. I would love to see because what, what Mrs. Smith and TCSG has done is, is really phenomenal and it's really hard to come by and it was a very exciting thing the first time we got the first blip about it because that money, their monies are so restricted, right. especially education money. And, and I would love to see businesses endorse adult education. I would love to see Barbara's boot rack pay for commercials to promote adult education. You know, have it, have it be a sponsor because you're doing so many things. You're, you, their employees will say, oh wait, they approve of this. And it would help us get that word out more and having people speak to themselves, yes, that's the ones they will listen to. I'm sorry, but I just had no, to. That's okay. Please. <laughs> and we also have a back. question from the go to meeting. Yeah, from Trace. Oh, from Tracy Kembees, she wanted to know what parts of the programs are dealing with or help individuals that are struggling to take the GED overcome the literacy challenges before taking the GED or applying to post high school education. So the issue is, if they uh, take the adult education classes, I mean, I think that's the easiest. That that really is the answer. We're finding that the pass rate for students who take our adult education classes is 89 percent versus the pass rate of those who don't, that's somewhere around 50 some. So the, the fact that they're actually in class and taking the classes, and you know, they, while they're there, the other thing we can do is ass assess if they have learning disabilities or there's another issue that they're trying to deal with uh, in those situations. So if they're actually in a class, because right now I think only 35% of the people who take the GED are taking our classes. 
a majority of those people who are passing the GED are the ones who are taking our classes. The, one of the big issues, and I guess this is a good point I should make, because it's, it's kind of a blinding, what do they call it, blinding thing, the obvious. If we can get more people to be aware that the classes exist, we'd have more people passing the GED test and more people that you could put in the workforce. So a part of our issue, this awareness issue, and I guess I should explain, what we put out there are not PSAs. These are real life commercials that we pay commercial time for. But commercials are not that expensive. We found out we can buy time on MeTV because if you watch um, television in the middle of the night, which unfortunately I do because that's my quiet time, uh, you see all kinds of ads for to go to school and to take classes. And I've told TCSG you need to advertise at three and four in the morning because that's where all your competitors are advertising. So what we did, we put these commercials on. We started with MeTV and they come on after shows that that folks watch in the middle of the night. And I was really excited to see some of our commercials that we paid for on there. But that really and the geofencing, having these commercials on a cell phone, we had no idea the impact of doing that. Uh, and the cost of that is really extremely reasonable, which is why I say it really doesn't cost any much. You have to figure out where the people who don't have the classes watch TV and what they pull up on their computer, oh, what they pull up on their cell phones. They pull up games on their cell phones. So if you set those commercials to come up when somebody puts on certain games and you figure out which games they watch, then they see, they see the commercials because they automatically pop up with this geofencing thing I didn't know exist. If you put the commercials on in the middle of the night uh, on certain channels, then they see it. Uh, so we figure we can get them into class. But the big thing that would help people get over their issues and be able to identify problems in terms of passing the GED is to get them into an adult education class. And if we can find a way to increase awareness to actually get them to take the classes we offer, we're finding their success rate, even if it's just a matter of moving from one level to another, is very high. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Question or comment? Yes, thank you. Um, so, Beverly, you were sort of addressed what I was going to ask, it, but it was more directed because Daphne had some, said th something as well about reach. And so, was is reach an issue? So, it's getting the word out. Um, but bef just before that, one question I had before, because I do, it's kind of a two part question, if sure. that's okay. Um, you mentioned, Daphne, that there was, which I really appreciate having been out of the adult developmental reading arena for a while, it, you had to remind me that, yes, indeed, it doesn't matter if a child is reading on level by third grade. I mean, it does. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> That's what we're about. But, but after that, there's, there's a lot more to continuing to, to mature in the reading capacity and that sort of thing, which I, I think is amazing, and you're absolutely right. So my question is, do you think that there's something that's not happening in early education that if identified and rectified would reduce the reading literacy issues that we encounter at eighth grade and 10th grade and, and that sort of thing? Well, as somebody who's passionate about adult literacy, what I'll say is that we're not tackling the issues that the parents have, right? So, um, for instance, if you take a child who comes from a household where the parents are modeling reading, reading um, on, I guess they're not reading newspapers anymore, but they're reading on the computer about what's going on in world events. Maybe they're listening to the TV, the radio. They're talking about all this stuff that's going on in the world. They're teaching critical thinking. There's a lot that goes on in an educated family unit that unfortunately does not go on in a family unit that doesn't have that education. So that's one thing. So it's, it's, it's once again, you can't, you can't just solve the issues that the children have just by focusing on the children. You also have to look at what's going on with the parents. In terms of the other issues, um, I'm sure, I, I'm not a childhood educator, so I can't tell you what's not working in middle school and high school, but I do know that children are getting to those grades. They're doing, they did fine in elementary school, but they're not picking up the comprehension skills that they, they, that they need. And it really becomes, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Matthew effect. So the poor gets poorer while the rich get richer. So if they don't have certain skills at seventh grade, let's say in terms of comprehension and so forth, they're not going to be able to do well in high school. Great. So then my second part of that yep. was about reach. So I love all the, the mobile classrooms and all that sort of stuff, but are you finding that, you're, and I believe that's what I was hearing you say, Beverly, which was we're just not re getting, getting to a lot of the folks that, that could be benefiting from this. Just, it's just about awareness in some cases and, and getting them motivated to do that. Would that. Is that true? It's awareness. It's access. 
Um, it, it's all kinds of things. So I, I think the mobile classroom is a great idea to get to those rural areas where transportation is an issue and, and so forth. Um, I don't know if you, you have anything more to say about that or? The reason I ask is this, is because in our program that serves birth to five, provides books to children, and of course we work on the parent component as well, once we see books starting going into the home, especially for parents who are not re who are non-readers at whatever level, a lot of times they'll start reaching out to us, about, because what happens is this, children's books demystify the whole process of reading. All of a sudden you have a parent that has spent their life thinking, I can't read, I'll never learn to read, I'm terrible, I can't do it. They have a kid, they start getting books into the home and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, I can read these words. You know, reading, it, it, you know, obviously, you know, there's not gonna be a college textbook, but all of a sudden it starts just demystifying the whole process for them. And we do have parents, our parents reach out to us and say, where can I take GED classes? Where can I learn to read? And, and I think we could do more of that. I mean, I think we, and I think DECAL could totally do more. Of, I mean, I don't know what exactly, exactly all that you are doing. I know that we are in a lot of the quality rated daycares in the APN, or now the West Side and in Clayton County, where we work to work with these daycares getting quality right. rated. And quite frankly, and we're working with those parents and we're doing period education on literacy training for the kid about what you can be doing in the home. But the point is, I think that that's, uh, if it's not already being as utilized as much as it can, I think that's definitely a place to get those parents because all of a sudden, I think they're riper. I think some of those adults are riper because all of a sudden they have kids. I know our parents, you know, once, the, the, our parents want those books because they don't want their kids to not read right. like they can't read. Right. You know, and so if there's a way we would be, if the, and we're already, you know, I've, I've talked with uh, uh, Joy about, we've talked a little bit more about 2Gen and that sort of thing, and I, I know that we, we, we want to do a lot more in terms of the 2Gen thing, and if there's something we can do, we have 35,000 parents Great in point. Georgia, so. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say I agree with you, and that's where my recommendation about a, a major clearinghouse and hotline and so forth comes in. Um, and I know that you're already doing some of that, that in terms of your awareness and, and a telephone number, but we need more of that, absolutely. One, I'm wondering if there has been any work done looking at incentives for people who are learning to read for students, like fiscal incentives, like if you come and take this class, we'll, we'll pay you a stipend. I mean, we we refund money for people to go to medical school. You know, we pay people's medical school costs. We pay certain uh, technical college costs for folks who go to different, into different fields. Why not cover the cost for people, or, or in, you know, in addition to childcare, which we all know is a, a need and expensive, but on top of that, another added bump might bring in some more folks. I don't know, it's just an idea. We got it captured, there. perfect. Thank um, you. Another, I, another question, that because I don't, I don't do adult literacy, most of my work's been in the child's sphere, but is there, speaking of games, and how the ads are coming up on the games, Beverly, is there a video game that's compelling that would teach reading? Oh, yeah. I mean, is, is, or is there any work being done in that field? Because I'll tell you what, the age group that I was looking at of the folk, of the people, and especially males who need to learn to read, it just seems like it would be a natural, private, and not embarrassing way to learn to read. So I just wanted, um, if you want to know more about the online kind of stuff, I, I don't know if you were when I were here when I was presenting, but for the Center for the Study of Adult Literacy, we were actually given money to develop an online interactive program to teach comprehension skills to adults who read below the eighth grade level. And they extremely find it engaging and like doing that. And um, Beverly, I know you know about many other kinds of programs also. Yeah, and we use, adult students don't do well online class all the time. They don't have the discipline to do that. But we are trialing something and we have some teachers, there are some adult ed class programs that are on cell phones that look like games and you can actually put a cell phone up on a screen and I've seen it in some other states where they actually can do things on their cell phones and that's how they're learning. I mean, they know how to use a cell phone really well. Most of them know how to read with the cell phone. So you can, if you have a tech savvy program that actually uses cell phones to teach 
and those are out there. It's not something that we've done a whole lot of, but we certainly have explored it to take a look into it. That gaming thing, I mean, when my, um, my, my daughter taught my, her four-year-old to text, and I was extremely annoyed because I said, you know, there's enough texting going on. She said, no, you don't understand. She's learning the alphabet. She's learning how to spell. She's learning how to use a computer because she's doing all this on the cell phone. So, you know, I dropped my concern. But that, that's the kind of thing that a parent could do with a child in terms of teaching, and they both get something out of it because they're playing with this. But there are apps where we can, in fact, do adult education on cell phones. Uh, to try and get them. We just haven't, we haven't explored that in great detail yet. And I would just say that Georgia gaming development is one of our biggest industries and growing industries. And why not tap into the gaming industry and have that's them develop idea. something that's not just like teach, I don't know what they look like, but I know if you're like in a, like in a car chase or a, something, you know, there are other ways to get other right. like gaming like my 14 year old likes to do that could be more, co could be compelling as well. I mean, I don't, I don't, it's not my field, but I, I just have to think that with all of the gaming industry that we have in Georgia, why are we not using that? That is great a question. great idea. Yep. I have two brief comments. The first one is around the marketing of this. I briefly got to hear somebody from Coca-Cola talk about how they target kids to buy soda and popcorn at movie theaters when it's raining outside. They increase their push of go buy popcorn, go to the movie when it's raining outside. So bringing people like that that work in the business community in the marketing industry that know about all those, I mean, it's insane what they can do to help us push out this information would be a great way to bring the business community into this. My second question is for you about your meeting at the airport which I found very interesting, and wanted to know if you were including other people along the literacy spectrum in that, because it seems like a really good ecosystem where we have good workforce development programs. It'd be a great opportunity to incorporate quality rated Head Start programs and work with their public school system to kind of work at this problem as a whole instead of just individually. And that seems like an ecosystem that is up and coming where they might be open to saying, hey, we want to attack literacy as a whole in this area. So just a general comment. Yeah. We're actually looking at that. Um, when I met with the airport, I asked them about putting a daycare center. They need one. I don't know why they yeah. don't have one, but they don't have one. Yeah. But um, we've explored that with them. And I actually have talked to her about having a daycare center in there so that the parents could go to school and we can do some teaching. So we did kind of a wish list kind of meeting. But they, they bought it. At least I found some, somebody who was willing to take the bite. And they're actually doing a survey with the employers at the airport. And we've scheduled a second meeting on October 6th to try and see if they've made success with the employers there to do that. And they do have a place where they could actually put a daycare. I mean, I've gone yeah. that far. I've seen the building plan. So hopefully we can really get them to really buy into this and focus on it. But that kind of thing is exactly what we're looking at. Right. And bringing in workforce development and also Absolutely. the public school I already talked to Ben Hames about it. Yeah. in that area because we've talked a lot about kids dropping out of school so if we're focusing really hard in one area on those two let's make sure we're focusing on the middle grades yeah. as well. Yeah, I think it's a great incubator and I've, I've talked to Ben Hames about actually workforce going in there as well so we're, yeah. we're trying to look at a holistic concept there. Yep. Thanks for that. My comment I just and I was really eager because the question was how are the public schools I hate to say failing but missing with children um, and not getting the reading levels where they should be. And I just from my experience with uh, a program we do in Columbus we've done for years is they're walking in the door at pre-k at two different levels. We have programs in Columbus that we do with pre-k children, one-on-one -on -one pre k program, and we test these little babies, four to five years old, we test their vocabulary level. And we get their exact age and, and they may be four years old, three months and two days. And their vocabulary will test as a three-year-old or a two-year-old, and it is not rare, okay? And then you have teachers who are forced to teach to the lowest denominator. Those smart kids are going to get bored. They're going to get lost. You cannot expect a classroom of children with th this vast basic starting point to all learn the same way and the same thing. And we're doing a disservice to both ends of the spectrum when we mandate that everything must be exactly the same. And in our little eight-week one-on-one program, we can bring up the vocabulary level of those children an average of six to eight months among the groups. But I mean, last spring, we had at least four children get over 12 months vocabulary gain 
and it's just really reading with the children and helping them understand but it's very unfair to hold a teacher to a standard when all of her ingredients are not the same quality. Right. Yep. And isn't it interesting how your paradigms of age and learning and grades influence what we're doing? So first grade is for what age, right? Versus first grade is for what mastery level? Interesting comments. Yeah, so completely different direction, I guess. One of the things that's just been um, interesting me today, so I'm one of the, the people from the business community, doesn't understand the depth of a lot of the issues that you all do, but I'm, I want to applaud Joy and the co-chairs for having us as a commission look in a segmented fashion, where we look at early learning separately, where we look at, uh, you know, our educational process is looking at adult, and, and uh, quite honestly, adult literacy of the set the, the area that I was least educated around. Um, I'm struck today listening to us that so much of our conversation is around awareness at, for the recipient. It just, you know, it, we're not talking about depth of resources. We're not talking about um, platforms that we talked about at the other levels. So, I, you know, I, and I hear, I continually hear references to the business community could and should. I don't know that there is awareness in the business community that individuals who could be the recipients of these sorts of programs are them, their, their lack of awareness is actually the primary barrier. And as I look across the, the four elements that we focused on, um, I just feel there's an enormous opportunity for us as a commission to find the, simplicity, the, the simple way of taking this incredibly complex issue, which is so different at each of these levels, and finding whether it's the simplicity of a model or the simplicity of an integrated message, because this is, today I just find so different than what we've talked around in the other elements. And I don't know that there is a natural inclination outside of all of the incredible experts in this room to know that, that that's the lever to pull on this. And, and I'm just going to toss out that perhaps this multi-generational view is the way to do that. Maybe that's a, a platform for thinking about whether it's a model or a core communication element around it. Today just felt different than the other days. Yeah. And I just felt well, Thank you very to, much for that comment. Yeah. Yeah, and we need to wrap today up. And so our focus on adult literacy has ended. Thank you very much for this afternoon, and we will see you again soon.